This is the Darwin Orver podcast, a companion to my YouTube channel about making and building. Here we talk about things surrounding those subjects, as well as thoughts about culture, society, science, and anything in between. Thank you for listening. Okay, what do you got? I was just thinking about how, like, the concept of we're going live, you know, how weird that is. Because when you say that, that sounds like... That means the computer begins to... It record. means that the computer begins. It's not like, okay, we're going out on a stage, and there's a thousand people in the audience, and now we're going live. And the applause start coming. Well, I It just means th- that you push the on button on I the don't computer. Think any, I don't think anybody's applauding. No, maybe not. The, uh, yeah, the, the record button has been pushed. The record button Let's has just been define pushed. It as that. It's like the solitary notion of... Of doing this kind of thing, of doing anything these days, like having people uh, listen to your your thoughts, is that what you w- mean? Well, I mean, ha- doing anything, whether it's video or writing or, or or recording a podcast like this, where when you do it, you're all by yourself and there's no one there. Well, I'm here. Yes, but it, there's not, it's not quite as effectful as when you're in front of a crowd. You know, like oh. if you're on stage, for example. I mean, I grew up doing lots of things on stage, loved the theater. And it was always so special when you went out on stage, you know, and the lights come in your face and the audience is there and you're nervous. And there's just something very special about that. And here, you are talking to people or or videotaping to people and you, it's so separate. You really don't see them or feel them, you know? No, <laughs> you don't. This is more like, uh, I guess, uh, like a letter, or a it, diary it, it, entry. That's exactly what I was thinking. It's all private, sort of. It's more really. of a the solitary act of a writer who is all by himself or herself. Well, that's why the technology it changes the way everybody does things. Yeah. It's like you you couldn't do this. In the, I mean, you, could, you know, I, you might have sat there with a cassette recorder and hit record. Yeah. Kind of concept. Just because it was cool to hear your voice. Yeah. Or <laughs> Did you ever do that? Yeah. I used to do that too. I used to record all these tapes. It never recorded and, well though. No, they were terrible. Yeah. But I used to think it was the coolest thing ever that I was able to record like a like a show, you know. <laughs> I, I you, you know I I played my own songs, and I thought you know they were really cool, but. Because I played them for my mom. That's about it. <laughs> <laughs> and now it's where you're in a in a room, and other people are going to hear. Hopefully. Maybe. Well, I don't even know if it's to be hopefully. Yeah. But it's. Uh, it's but out there. But the it's a creative is, expression. The thing is that you, it, I think the difference is that when you record it, you have no idea if anybody's going to hear. Whereas if when it's a performance, you have a very clear view of how many people are viewing. It's right there, you know? Isn't that kind of funny? Yes. It's more of a direct kind of like, you're on stage, you're on, you know? You understand what's going on. I, I don't think I have quite as much on stage experience <laughs> as you do. Well, you're on in the videos, I suppose, but then again, that gets edited and everything. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. It's a little different, no one's applauding. Honestly. No. <laughs> Not really. No. no one's going to applaud no for one's a going YouTube to applaud. video. It's very different. Yeah. Maybe that's why that it's still really a good idea to connect with audiences. Like, if you have a book, mm-hmm. then do a book signings or do a book talk. Right. Or... It's like that's what's missing in a way that connection with people. Because I used to love have... watching C-SPAN when they did all the book <laughs> talks on Saturdays and Sundays. Yeah. Um, you and what five other people? <laughs> well, yeah. It was a very small audience. They used to things. go in, uh, you know, Powell's bookstore, yeah. or all sorts of all over the country. Right. And, the, you know interesting books and people would ask you know interesting questions and it was a small audience it felt very intimate those yeah. things like you it but it was, was being recorded so yeah. you know they got out there yeah yeah but i don't think people you know i guess small performances also with music mm-hmm. there's not as many places to go and listen to people no the idea of the jazz club or the small kind of club where you go and or the coffee the, shop where people the, can right. play music you know right yeah you don't see that don't quite see as much that anymore much. Our local um, coffee shop. Uh, they used to do that all the time, uh, and now they don't do, do it anymore. Yeah, times change. I mean, I, that's I was just thinking about that before. I was thinking about how how you can really appreciate a certain moment in time, and things may seem perfect in some ways. Certain things may seem just 
like you don't want them to change and then you get reminded of the fact that that is never the case things always change there, it is nothing as certain as change I, I guess um, isn't that a sad thought well whether it's 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 mostly your memory of it yeah if you didn't have much of a memory you probably wouldn't have that issue yeah I guess so uh, yeah it's like people get everybody get everybody gets older you can't stop that so you, and you can't sh stop changes you can get rid of your memories all the time how, how do you do that well I don't know uh, I try mean, not to remember too much to begin with eternal sun, sunshine on the spotless mind you know <laughs> go yeah. through a uh, some well, kind of procedure and remove certain memories maybe that's a good idea you think that's a good idea well why not so like okay. the removal of memories if we were able to re re remove memories what do you think it would do uh, you would you'd forget something <laughs> okay <laughs> yes that's the obvious reason but what do you think it would do to the mind well, you'd learn stuff again. I think we said this uh, one at some point. Um, if you have a memory of a song, uh -huh. and you associate it with, I don't know, like buying a dog or, you know, I don't know, buying a car. Yeah. And if you erase that memory, you'd, and then you could hear the song again, you'd have a new memory. Yeah. So you'd still like the song, most likely. It would just be a new memory. And you would just not remember the first time you heard it. Yeah. You kind of forget stuff all the time anyway. Well, actually, I was listening to uh, a, a podcast the other day, like a Radio Lab podcast. It was, it was an, this was an old one, and it was about memory. And they were talking about how uh, they had some scientists, a researcher on there, who was talking about how uh, the truest memories are the memories that you don't access very often. In other words, the memories that aren't very dear to you, the ones that you don't you know, go back to. So, for example, the day... Truest also means boring. Yes, exactly. So, I mean, maybe your first kiss or, uh, you know, the day something bad happened, the day there was an accident, the day, I don't know, How something first. I'm just, saying, I'm just saying that those memories th you tend to go back to because they were, they were strong. Oh, oh you mean, uh, Those okay. are the yeah. memories that every time you go you. back to those, you alter that memory. Yeah. You change it in some way. And it, it becomes less true. And the memories that aren't that important, the ones that you that you maybe accidentally trigger, you mm -hmm. smell something or you are in a situation, you have a deja vu or something else happens and you remember something, but you don't access that memory very often. Those are much more true. Uh, because but they're also the boring ones. Yeah, exactly. Well, so yeah, they don't I'm have as sure much the meaning. Of that. But I just thought that was interesting. Well, I mean, I on on as a, as a mechanical system, I guess you're, it has to be true. Yeah. Um, so it makes sense, but it also means that you there's lots of things you never think of that when brought up again weren't that important to begin with. Yeah. You never think of them again. Yeah. So I'm not sure. Yeah. It's, I guess the meaning, I mean, the point of it is questionable, but I, I just thought the concept that, you know, if you have a favorite memory, you tend to go back to it, how it's not so, that might not have been what happened, oh. or it, it, at least not quite like well, that, because uh, yeah. you have, over time, slightly changed it to f make it fit your your. I agree Your in ways. general. I don't, I don't think people should trust their memories. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, don't think I guess the like uh, witness, testimony, that's exactly you know? witness testimony is the worst kind. Can't yeah. be trusted. I never trust myself with memories like that either. No? I don't have, I don't, you know. A lot of people are very sure of themselves with their memories and you know they're absolutely wrong. Uh -huh. um, and they have no idea that they're that wrong. I definitely don't trust my memory or anybody else's memory <laughs> to recall any event. You know. Do you and remember your first memory? No, no, I mean, no. I mean, no. what does that mean? Well, I mean, people often have, like, a first memory. And I remember, like, when I was, like, three or four, going into the kitchen and getting an orange bucket, and then going back into the living room and turning it upside down and jumping on top of it. But I don't know if it's a real memory. I remember right. thinking about it, like, that's my first memory. I kind of made it a thing. That's So you're basically accepting that your brain is very unreliable. Yeah, exactly. I agree with that. It's unreliable. And I can't trust it. I can't no. trust if that was actually my first memory. And it was not a significant memory enough to to, to collaborate with anybody else. <laughs> yeah, you mean to confirm. Right, it wasn't yeah. like, oh, you remember the day when, you know, this person got married and that's my first yeah. memory, you know? Yeah. I love getting into arguments with people, and especially, you know, if they 
if we both remember the same situation uh -huh. and they remember it like very differently uh -huh. <laughs> and it's like th we're both probably wrong yeah it doesn't really matter yeah you know it, it, that's why well if you if you're concerned about things like that you that's why there's diaries and journals right to write that stuff down to write it down to make well, sure it that's doesn't. why especially it's important things like mm -hmm. you know how much grain you grew or something <laughs> well, I mean, or how that's much you why sold I, i'm always fascinated by historians who write you know you know books and how many how they really dig through the archives and then they collaborate things that happened that maybe may not be well known and say well this person wrote it in their diary and this person yeah. wrote it in this diary, that this person was at this event you know yes. and i always find it so fascinating that they they dig through all these records these people's journals that, that they were not like they didn't realize at the time were going to be used to uh you know to make sure that this historical thing actually happened well you know? i guess uh, if you do write a journal and a diary about like events you've experienced, mm. it is uh, it is good for the future because it does provide sort of you become a witness, yeah, um, to what went on, and if if it can be corroborated with someone else, then yeah. then it's a good thing. Mm. Of course, now everybody's got video cameras, yeah. So it's a little it's different. almost like, however, uh, I don't know. It's almost like digital footage just seems to be like one big mess. Well, we were. I remember what was it a couple of years ago now? We built uh, uh, the. Uh, the, what is that? The brick wall, mm -hmm. the sitting wall. Yeah, in the uh, backyard here. And yeah. And we were going over, like, if we wanted to put a little time capsule inside. Yeah. Because it was a, uh, it was a. You it's know, like there a was half space wall. Inside. It's like you can. It's, it's like a, a bench. Wall. It's like a half wall. Yeah. So the I remember brick. thinking, if we wanted to put a time capsule in it, that would last for say a hundred years. Uh huh. So that someone took a sledgehammer to that thing a hundred years from now, opened it up, and. What would you actually put in it to you guarantee know, that there would be something to remember, like some? That's one of writing. those things that you know. How important is that? Because somebody, if we found something no, from no, no, somebody no. else, I'm talking from the point of view of not the importance of it. I'm talking about what can you get to last. Uh huh. I'm talking about like if you stuck oh, an SD card. Okay, in, oh, okay. From that point of view, you're talking about what? To, what? You format. must have forgotten this conversation that we had two years ago or three years ago. Okay, I understand what you mean now. Yeah. You're basically going you, getting, glad, getting it to the point that would. I'm you glad need. you remember finally that we had this two or three. See, <laughs> your memory is unreliable. Your memory is really unreliable. <laughs> you're getting to the point that the only thing that's uh, reliable is paper. And pen. Yes. Or pa you know. You took the wind out of my story, but yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So I was going down the line of cassettes and CDs and SD cards and DVDs and hard drives and right. USB sticks and all that junk and, and mini discs. Mm -hmm. and there's a ton of things to... LPs. <laughs> yeah, there's a ton. Actually, that might be all right. Yeah. Because that's analog, just yeah. like paper and just like a stone tablet or something. Mm -hmm. That's the only thing you can really rely on that would be there. If you basically took that a piece of paper and you wrote down whatever on mm -hmm. it and you wanted somebody 100 years from now to read it and you vacuum sealed it in some kind of plastic to make sure it didn't like rot, Yeah. Um, that would be readable. Assuming they read English, right? That would be readable, and whereas you, any technology else, would be you unreliable. wouldn't be able to listen to it. You wouldn't be able to. Well, I mean, yeah. okay, when they sent out the time capsule, I mean, uh, like the Voyager, exactly. They they sent along a tape recorder, didn't they? Um, they sent well, it was, or something it was, like that. It was an aluminum disc um, that was uh, what do you call it? Uh, it was uh, yeah, it was a record player, um, and so that it was like a really dense record player that that had images and music. Do you remember what exactly what did it had like Beethoven? Yeah, yeah, it was Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. It had. <laughs> I think images from obviously the Bible. It had like Leonardo da Vinci, um, all sorts of stuff like that. Right. Well, it was the premise of the uh, the first Star Trek movie. Oh really? In 1979. The, oh, was uh, it? The it was a horrible movie, but it was a cool, <laughs> it was a cool concept. Basically, an alien species comes across this this uh, you know this the, the vehicle that was launched in 1979, Voyager. Uh huh. And then the uh, the this alien species, you know. I don't remember exactly. It grows from it. It learns from it. Oh. And it comes back to Earth. Huh. And it calls itself Voyager, Like Voyager. But oh. they, mis they mispronounced it or mis it was mislabeled or whatever it was. And they had, you know, they, known, they knew all sorts of information about humans because it was put in that disc. That hmm. aluminum uh, record disc. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was a highly dense disc. It wasn't like a regular LP. 
it was uh, it had a lot you know much data you know, denser data hmm. and uh, anyway so yeah that's analog Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And they built a machine to recover that data. Yeah. You know, in in that capsule. Yeah. Have they sent any other ones out there after uh, that? Do you know? I, I don't know. Probably. I'm uh, not really sure. It's almost like who who decides what goes in one of those. I remember Carl Sagan had uh, impact on that. Did he? Um, I'm oh. sure a lot of people did though. That's interesting. Um, it was a major event. Like it, when you encounter, if you encounter an alien race. What do you want them to see of the, of humanity? Yeah, exactly. What would you put in that if you were making one, sending it out? Like if you were like as an individual. I believe all of the probably everything in it can be found on Wikipedia. I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, I'm not really sure. I never looked at it, but yeah. I'm sure it's all there. Yeah. But I, I, you know, obviously it's a lot of things. It's about you know humans and plants and animals and right. know, the history of Earth. <laughs> well, I guess if you were able to send along a, uh, a computer in some way, you could. Put on so much information these the days. The problem is, is uh, will the signal be degraded? Can you recover the mm -hmm, information? Mm -hmm. Is it going to be subject to magnetic fields and, right. and solar radiation? Yeah, that's the problem. That's why paper and pen is still the best. <laughs> or a, an aluminum disc that is an analog kind of recording device. Right. In other words, I mean, not that you can't do that with digital, but digital is going to be. Uh, it's usually recorded optically, which is sensitive, like a CD is sensitive to radiation. Uh -huh. And, um, you know, obviously discs are usually magnetic too. Yeah. So you need something like a record player disc or a record player LP that is, you know, has got bumps. Mm -hmm. That right. has vibrations. That can, that can, exactly, right. Yeah. That's how Edison first did it with the wax. Yeah. He's, you know, yelled into it and the little needle pushed onto the wax. What was the first message again? It was like... Um, Mary had a little lamb or something like it that. It was, you know, I think that's what it was. Yeah. Yeah. I love the idea of that going out into space. Well, I think and more. And even though it will probably just stay out in space forever. Well, it's probably pretty slow too. Yeah. I mean, I'm not sure. I think it just left. Um, I don't know. I can't remember. A couple of years ago, it left the solar system finally. Did it? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Maybe that was. It could have been ten or fifteen years ago, but whatever oh. it was, it might have been more recent than that. I don't remember. Hmm. But it's going to take a while to get anywhere. Yeah. Um, I think the more important point is transmitting information to the future. Mm -hmm. That's the difficult thing. And people, I mean, I guess you would think that that information is just automatically saved. You know, where, cause, I mean, where? because we are, I don't know. I mean, because when you think, okay, we have to send it out into space, that's a very careful operation. But just preserving it for ourselves in the future or our offsprings. That yeah, seems but how are you like you're not going to preserve it. I don't know. You constantly have to transfer whatever information you have to the new technology. Uh, well, that's what everybody's doing, and, yeah. and that's a that's a pretty inefficient way. And look it's at all like, the VHS tapes that are kind of like rotting and have been rotting. Yeah, or the slides. Yeah, slides. <laughs> that's right. All those boxes of slides that. Uh, yeah. Well, many people probably don't know what slides are, but um, unless you're a little older, but. <laughs> My my parents did slides a lot. Did your parents do slides at all? I, you know what? I don't think so. I think that maybe my mom had uh, some slides, but I never saw them. We didn't have a machine, a reader to, a reader to, yeah. to read them. Well, so. the slides, I think, were used... Um, I'm not sure. I mean, they technically still exist, and people mm. still use them. But um, I think uh, my family stopped using them a, quite a long time ago, and then the disposable cameras came out. Yeah. And they stopped, you know, the 110 film and, right. and, and junk like that and the disposable 30, 35 millimeters. But um, the slides are a perfect example of as the longer it sits around, it gets damaged by heat. Right. And, and so lights. then in order for you have to translate those, <laughs> change those into more modern. Well, format. I, I, we were talking to somebody a couple months ago who they're, you know, they're really they're making it their kind of job. They're older now and they're making it their job to, to remember but you know to translate all this to CDs or DVDs or whatever. Yeah. But and then they basically think about getting rid of the source material. Mm -hmm. the source They're slides. like they were really happy now. Finally, we can just throw those out. Yeah, and I, I just really can't understand that. I, I just think that's a really bad idea. You, you basically, those originals can never be replaced. Yeah. And the, the right. copies they you made... They carry so much more information. Yeah, they are they so do. much clearer and they are well, so much... You know, that's one point that the, 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 the reader you use, a scanner to use to, mm -hmm. to read the, uh, the image off the, the slide is probably not as good as it could be. 
Yeah. So you're missing information. Right. You know, it can't, it can't blow it up quite as big as it should or whatever. Yeah. A slide has a lot of great information. I mean, it's a negative, basically. Right. Well, it's not right. a negative, but it's close. It's like a negative. Yeah. You can reproduce it from that or reproduce the image very accurately. Yeah. And so when you get rid of the source material, it's like everybody's happy that they got rid of it. They think it's... It's crazy. It's this inherent want to clean and get rid of things. I don't know if it's about... No, I, I think it's the inherent trust that you're going to be able to rely on a CD or something okay, like so that. Okay, so in other words, you can't trust... You can't trust the future and you can't trust... No, 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 no. You can't trust that... You can't trust a CD is going to be able to hold that material for like a you know a few years. Or well, I mean that you can't trust the future in the sense that you can't trust that someone else is going to carry that information from the CD yes, to yes, the exactly. yeah. DVD... To the, uh, the yeah. SD card yeah. and so forth. And the thing is, is that even and, though... And you can trust that the, it's going to be safe on whatever server you put it on and that that server that's isn't thing. going that's, to that's, go that's, down. That's, that's different. The, I think the issue basically is that even if the, the, the slide degrades in quality mm -hmm. from being heat damage or something, there's still a lot of recoverable material. Yeah. But if a disc gets eroded by light or heat, mm -hmm. that's it. Yeah. I mean, much of it is going to be lost. Right. You get a larger data loss with that kind of recording. Yeah. But somebody basically is like, okay, well, I'm going to hand this to my kids or grandkids or whatever, and then I'm going to rely on them to do it. <laughs> Maybe they have no interest. Yeah. And it's not readable on some hidden It's disc. amazing when you think about how deluded families get so quickly, you know? You're really moving right into that, huh? How well, I was just <laughs> thinking about how, you know... You pass your slides on to your children, and then you hope that they are going to pass them on to their children and their children. Well, do you but really? But so soon, people lose interest. I mean, I don't. I, I I love that stuff, but so many people just aren't interested in their family's histories. And it's like, well, whatever children you have, very quickly you're not that related to them anymore. I don't know. I think you. I think you're looking at that the wrong way. I think you want people to lose interest in their family histories. <laughs> I don't think you really want them clinging to that. Everybody yeah, loves to, so. you know, do genealogy yeah. every once in a while, especially as they get older. Yeah. But do you really want your family history to be... To be the, your focus of your life. Or to sense. be anybody's focus. Yeah. Yeah, I guess it's a good thing that people kind of move on and don't focus on that anymore. People, you know, I mean, can you name all your... Can you know any of your great-grandparents' names? I mean, no. what about your great-great-grandparents? No, I don't. It's like you're going to forget these people. They, right. They're going to forget you. And in some ways, I think that's actually a really good thing. I'm just thinking about how, um, like, my mom did genealogy research. And, and, and while, while it's interesting and kind of fun to see, ooh, we had this person was in our family or that person was born here or whatever, at the same time, I think it's like it, it makes you stuck in the past, in a sense. And it makes you not uh, excited and free from it. Because, like it's almost like you know, that's one thing I really love about the concept of the U.S. and the the philosophy behind it. That what it really is is like a fresh start. It's like go west, young man. You know, go to the frontier. I'm not get... sure that's true anymore. Though. No, I'm not saying. I know I'm not saying that it is true anymore. I'm saying that that's the philosophical idea of America. Which is you, why you mean for the people who came here at that given exactly. time. Exactly. Well, you know. whenever. Yeah, right. Like a long time ago now. <laughs> but I I love that idea. That it held, holds this concept of a promise of a better life. Then why do you want people to rec remember their history? No, you know, that's what I'm saying. slides and stuff. Well, like, yeah, <laughs> yeah it's kind of opposite, isn't it? And, but I'm saying that it's good in that sense to break away from your family and break away from your past. Because that way you are free and you no longer cling to it. I think, I think, <laughs> you could, I guess there's a lot of different ways you could look at that. Yeah. But I think it's probably a good thing because if you look too much to the family or mm -hmm. to your history... You're also putting too much emphasis and, and significance on the fact that that there's I don't know like either some genetic link between. Yes, actually, that's what I was going to get to as well. Because but then if you not. were like, hey, oh, you know, everybody in my family were farmers or whatever, and you know, we then it's like, why that's not related to you in a sense? You know, your your capabilities is not related to that, because it's all about your situation, your environment, your goals. And to even have that the, the, the focus of the past in your mind is is damaging in a sense. I agree, it's damaging. <laughs> it's it's not looking towards the future. No. Which is much more interesting. Yeah. To boldly go where 
No one has gone before. <laughs> yes. A Janeway was just awesome, wasn't she? No, don't go into Janeway. <laughs> don't, don't. Nobody likes Voyager. I don't think you understand that. You're one I of the few people why. who like that. Well, I think that Captain Janeway was just awesome. <laughs> <laughs> there you go for your female role models. Huh? Yeah, actually, I think she's a great female. Whenever somebody asks me for a female role model, I immediately <laughs> think of Captain Janeway, and then I remember she isn't real. <laughs> <laughs> You're one of the few people who probably see her as a role model, or or even liked that show and saw it. Well, maybe the earlier episodes and seasons weren't so great, but <laughs> later on it became very good. Lots of great episodes there. Yeah, Lynn is the great judge of TV shows. <laughs> <laughs> I think nothing beats the concept of time when it comes to thinking uh -huh. because it affects people. And How do you think thinking is different than creativity? How thinking is different from creativity. I mean, when you, somebody sits around and tries to be creative, how mm -hmm. is it different than when someone sits around and thinks? Ooh, well, I guess you have to think about what the goal is. And when it comes to creativity, the goal is to make something or create something. And when it comes to thinking, it can be just that you want to understand something. Well, you can have creative thinking. You definitely can yeah. have creative thinking. I'm not you can basically you can't. think thoughts that probably other people haven't yep yeah that is cool um so i don't know I, I think that's kind of a weird question so how do you how do you think how do you think more oh okay if you want to think more uh -huh. um what do you do do you have any strategies well i guess you need a reason to think so you need like problems ahead of you you need to solve things so you need to kind of Draw you know, okay, I think one of the one of the best ways to make yourself think more is just to surround yourself around people who force you to kind of um, compete. <laughs> it always comes back to competition. It does. It? And I'm not saying that in a bad way. You know, I'm saying that if you are in an environment where there are lots of discussions going on, then yeah. if you want to be a part of that, then you have to think and kind of, you know, participate. And that's going to make you think a lot more. When you think about your family history and people in the past, mm -hmm. how much thinking did you think they did? You know, oh... Not, uh, yeah. Not too much. Probably. Not too much. <laughs> it's it's kind of funny. We were always thinking about this, like, what is the result of? There's so much more education today. Yeah, and people are so much more aware. They are so much more aware. Yeah, but they're not, like, they don't get, you know, uh, <laughs> they don't know how to write better. They don't know math better. They don't know things better, really, but they're definitely more aware of the world. <laughs> you know, that kind of reminds me of like some of the soldiers in the Civil War. Mm -hmm. these, these soldiers who were not well educated, who wrote letters back to their loved ones, and they were so well written. Uh -huh. It was like a scholar today would have written these letters, and they, they were farmers or something. You know, yeah. but they were not farmers in the sense of that they had no education or that wasn't valued. Mm -hmm. You know, it, they, they did have basic education, but they wrote so well. It's like it, the standard in general was so much higher. The I, Well, I agree with you that writing has definitely changed. Um, you, I definitely always saw that in academic writing mm -hmm. over time. Or like differences between uh, when Darwin would write compared to... Um, you know, basically, his style was slow and methodical. Mm -hmm. It it was complete. Yeah. It was careful. Yeah. Well, Darwin was a very careful person in general. Yeah. It was very. Hence the dogs. The dog comes from Darwin. If anybody wonders about that, it's Charles <laughs> Darwin. Because um, we're biology oriented <laughs> group here. He was either that or Diocletian. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't want to stand in the park and right? call out, Diocletian, come here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was on the list. He was on the list, yeah. But when you go forward, um, you basically see that people begin to write simpler and simpler. Mm -hmm. And their, their technique changes a lot. I always found it really interesting that as you move through the late 19th and 20th centuries, you see this real change in sentence structure and complexity of lines, yeah. complexity of concepts. Mm -hmm. But then it, I, I started to think about it. I, I, I 
I was thinking about how um, William White is a good example. I, he's probably not well known now, but he was somebody who wrote about social causes, social concepts. Mm-hmm. He was a he wrote in magazines in the um, um, the thirties, the forties, and fifties and sixties, and he had a I don't know. I guess what you see is a modern writing style. Mm-hmm. I know this is not. So like you mean more conversational in a sense? Magazine style is what I would call it. Uh huh. And it's the beginning of the magazine style of writing in that period. But a lot of it is because they had a broader audience. More people were literate. Yeah. Than ever, and they have to get their point across easier and easier. Yeah. So it's hard to see where the pressure was. Hmm. But the technique was different. Mm-hmm. Um, one of my favorite examples is like when you look at say Darwin and then you look at um, what do you call it uh, Veblen uh, mm-hmm. the theory of the leisure class kind of stuff or uh, Santayana oh Santayana and the complexity sense of beauty yeah the sense of beauty is one of the awesomest books yeah and the complexity of the thought the the deliberateness of the sentences yeah he was well, trying to like discover things. The yeah. writing was discovering. But as you move more in the 20th century, you have this, uh, I don't know, the magazine style takes mm-hmm. over. And you have mm-hmm. it getting simpler and simpler as time goes on. So the more people learn how to read and write, the simpler things become. It's kind and of And it strange. almost feels like with the web that has increased even more, where yeah. the language has simplified even further. Yeah, yeah of course, yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't think that that's a bad thing or anything, but I think it's really interesting to see how the the thoughts associated, the structure of the sentences, have become really different. Yeah. It, it, I think it's a mirror on the brains that, <laughs> that are really out there. Okay, so if you say that, would you say that that's related to the, the amount of discipline in people's lives? Has, yeah. or maybe just the input? I think it's that... who's writing, too. Uh-huh. One of my favorite in- writers is Keynes. And, oh, um, the, um, the economist. Yeah, the economist. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, Maynard Keynes. And um, what was that book? The one he wrote Oh, yeah, it's about the crash? No, no, no. That's no. Galbraith. Oh. <laughs> no, that's, that's, that's almost magazine style writing. Yeah. That is a very, it's like journalistic writing. Yeah. yeah. No, I'm thinking of uh, uh, in 1919, he wrote the. Um, a case for peace, I think it was. Okay. Uh-huh. It's, oh, it's 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 just so elegantly written. Uh-huh. He's such a great writer, hmm. and he's a smart writer hmm. because he was so keenly aware of the internal politics of after World War One. Uh huh. It's so excellent. Hmm. He's such a great writer, and then he, I mean, not that he was writing, he wasn't writing like Darwin though, mm-hmm. or or any of the late nineteenth century you know, philosophers. Mm-hmm. Um, it was much more, I don't know, it keenly aware. Mm. You know, he wasn't discovering anything. He wasn't trying to discover, like, the way the world is. He wasn't observing and then saying, oh, I know this is happening. Mm-hmm. He was basically, like, he was keenly aware of the situation. Isn't that, like, a, a good point in general that that the ability to, like, yeah, read a room... Or yes. to understand what's going on behind the scenes or what's not directly like... He was great at that. Yeah. He's, he's a smart guy. That's a, that's a great skill to have. He's, uh, he's, the, he's the, you know, if anybody doesn't know his name, he's, he's the one who wrote the uh, general theory of employment mm-hmm. um, that people base the uh, government spending in the uh, Great Depression on. Uh-huh. Um, deficit spending and things like that. That's what he's associated with. Right. But he's he's such an interesting guy. Huh. And the you know both those books are really great books anyway. But yeah. the the style of writing is really interesting to note how how it's changed and the point. And I think it was who was writing though. Mm-hmm. The guys who were writing in the late nineteenth century were very careful. Mm. They were they were writing for a very small audience. Mm-hmm. And they were, you know, they would be, and they were taking, they were careful. They were, they were learning. They were trying to come up with something or discover something yeah. uh, subtly in, in a subject like economics or something. Um, whereas later on it was magazine style mm-hmm. and people uh, like, well, okay. I always, I always put William White and then I go to Jane Jacobs. Mm-hmm. She oh, was a, the, uh, well, she, yeah. Demogra- it was like neighborhoods and cities planning. Yeah, the, uh, and that's what she the, wrote about. The death of the, de- the great death of American cities. Right, or, right. Um, she's, yeah. uh, 
she's a totally different kind of writer. Yeah. And a different perspective. And she reminds me of that even more. It's a, it, but it's a book. I mean, it's, mm-hmm. a, it's a well-known book. Mm-hmm. But it's a, even more magazine-style writing. Huh. I, it's almost like I, the content of the writing, the subject, is almost not as important. It's like secondary to it's the how they style. wrote and what they were trying to get across. Uh-huh. And then it just got, you know, of course, lately, you know, like the last 50 years, it's just even become more that way. Yeah. Now people don't know how to spell. (laughs) (laughs) It's become more and more thin in that sense. Well, it's also, it's not just the language itself. It's the thoughts behind it. Mm -hmm. I think that's the significant part of that. Yeah. It's not just that people don't spell very well or, you know, their grammar is questionable. That kind of doesn't matter so Mm -hmm. much. It's the the complexity behind it. The complexity of their thoughts is severely diminished. Compared yeah. to the past. Yeah. Now, granted, yeah, the people who we are talking about were highly educated. They came from good backgrounds. They were given a lot of resources yeah. from for their family and society. And they were, you know, obviously... But, I mean, violence. even just like how nobody writes long sentences anymore. With you subordinate know? clauses. No. With that? With subordinate clauses. Yeah, no. right, exactly. I remember when we were in Paris and uh-huh. we were reading Thoreau. Yeah. And... And I remember, because this is, you, you know, you never read stuff like that too much. No, at the time. I didn't, no. Yeah, I remember and It was being, difficult to read that kind It of was English. very difficult to read that, uh, not like being a native English speaker. Uh, yeah. Because it was, the sentences never ended. <laughs> yeah. They were so long. I and, think and, that was... And it was like, exactly, each sentence carried so much. Yeah. You know, it it continued and it brought in other concepts, and other subjects, and then you know it could be a paragraph. One sentence could be one paragraph. Yeah. Yeah. And it, and it, nobody would would approve of that now. Right. No English teacher. I yeah. remember reading Emerson around the same time, and that was the same thing that you know his yeah. his work was also extremely. I remember long we, in that we were sense. reading Descartes at the time too. Uh huh. And well, obviously that's translated into English. Right. That language actually felt rather simplistic in it many ways. Was. It was. Yeah. It's translated. Right. So it, we were very rudely interrupted by... The by animal, Darwin yeah, outside. The animal Darwin. <laughs> <laughs> well, we were talking about Descartes. And uh, I remember reading... Um, that was... Which work was that? That was his uh, first... Uh, it was oh, like di- a discourse. A discourse on method. Of, yeah, yeah, exactly. A discourse on method. And... Um, I remember loving it. I remember really like. First of all, I love the the initial v- writing of that. He's in his room. He's got the fire going, and I love this situation, which I don't of course. I remember that stuff. It's, that's what I remember. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he's, he's he's sitting there in this uh, idyllic environment with a fire and his thoughts, and he's you mean thinking. His, his cold, damp. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. It's cold and damp, uh, and he's thinking these thoughts. And I remember thinking that this felt very modern. Yeah. And it wasn't. It's old. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, uh, that's kind of funny because when I think about uh, America and I think about uh, Jefferson and Washington and Adams and all of those people, whenever I read them, they feel so close in time. Yeah. Whereas if I read other writers from the same time period in Sweden or in France, they feel so much older. It just feels so much more like America felt much more modern at the same time. It it, it was more like the the, the it was very backwards. It, it was very backwards. In some ways, it was very backwards. Uh, but at the same time, it had these modern ideas. It of, is kind of weird to think the contemporaries, you know, Benjamin Franklin and Voltaire. Yeah. And things like that. I know. Yeah. And they don't they don't seem like they belong in the same world. Yeah. Like you have the the Swedish kings, and then you have yeah Jefferson, and you have, uh yeah, it seems really really weird. The end of the Swedish reign. Yeah. In the uh. Yeah. What is this? Uh, the Vasas. The Vasas. Well, that was that was a long time ago, but it was earlier. That was in that the eighteenth century. Sixteenth century. No. Seventeenth, eighteenth. Well, I better have to check on that one. Somebody should comment about we it. We need a fact checker. I can't remember. <laughs> yeah, we don't have a fact checker. <laughs> no, no. We have some Swedish history books. <laughs> but I'm not going to look for this now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I guess not enough people talk about history. <laughs> you, generally don't, you don't really hear people talking about history too much. But it's really so much fun. It's pretty fun. It's like, it's one of those things that it's like reading a novel in a sense that it's just, it can be very fun. Yeah. Because I love thinking that it it actually happened. How cool is that? 
you know <laughs> these people lived they thought these thoughts you know, I wish I could have just been there and, and had I guess if you're comparing them. it to the vast output of modern people with their cell phone pictures, yeah. And then, yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, Voltaire writing something is, is far more significant than somebody taking vacation photos. Yeah. But they kind of both get out there in the, in the world. Right. You know. Right. People just uh, share more, more stuff now than ever. And so you know, there's there's less of a like hierarchy of what's Voltaire style or good quality and what's like, everybody's not. on the same level. Yeah, everybody yeah. is. Yeah. You know, uh, one of my favorite things with studying history or studying um, historical people is when you understand connections. When you get like when you read about. Um, uh, like like Jefferson and all of them, and, and then I was reading about Alexander von Humboldt from Germany, who mm -hmm. was this naturalist and explorer, and he's not that well known in the U.S. comparatively. Even though tons of things are named after and him, tons of things are named after him, and he was very big in his time. He was like the most famous explorer of his time. Which just goes to show you, it, like long term, he's things, not considered. The it's same like marketing. Way. It's marketing. It, it all is. goes back to marketing. What is being brought up and talked about? But then I was just reading about. Um, Huell and uh, uh, Herschel and, and, and Darwin and then referring to Humboldt yeah. and then you realize what a small world it was you know and how how so many of these people who are in th these intellectual circles they all were aware of each other in one way or another yeah. and how yeah it must have felt like such a it must have been such a small circle in that sense and if you only were in it wouldn't that have been cool it but yeah, exactly. <laughs> the it reminds me of uh, Guti's Italian journey. Uh huh. And basically, this kind of, you know, the way they would travel, the, the like where the word tourist comes from, yeah. where you would tour. Where around. you tour, you have your European tour for, for months. At yeah, a time, right, and, right. Know. And then you had all these scenes that you had to go and visit. Yeah. Yeah. And these people, and people called on other people, other other intellectuals, and they stayed with them. You know. Yeah. Which everybody did to Guti later on. Yeah. Uh, that he was quite the person to go visit. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I guess. I guess. In, a lot in of that sense, it must have felt like the world was quite like it, there must have been so much more interaction. Like today, everybody are so isolated, and even though everybody's on on Instagram and Twitter and interacting with other people, not that bet on not that many people I are think, actually. I like, think there seems to be there was you could look at it as there was a great respect for what they were doing. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, there was more of an intellectual connection in that sense between these people. Yeah, obviously now um, there's companies are different. Yeah, and everything's yeah. in the way, and, and it's the just evil companies. <laughs> well, not just yeah, but <laughs> people aren't like as rich in some ways. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, the very few people who were rich at that time. Yeah. Who could explore? Who had the whatever. freedom to go travel in that sense? And yeah. Yeah, of yeah. course, yeah, well, well, I guess we never see all of the very, very poor people who supported all of these people right. to be so wealthy. Right. Uh, but it seems like they, they did get a lot of thoughts on, mm -hmm. and that's interesting, and, yeah. and that's what we remember. Yeah. And those are, they did have many great thoughts. Yeah, and some of them were so, they did so much. And I guess it's kind of weird when you learn about these things in school or something, mm -hmm. and how... You really, with if you don't immerse yourself in it, it's mm -hmm. like, it's just books on a shelf. Yeah. And it's not the same. Yeah. It's like, I love it when you get like a personal connection to something. Where you read about a person or uh, a situation, then you feel like you were, like you now have this personal connection with it. Which is almost like you can only get that if you study it on your own. Because mm -hmm. if you are reading it in, in school, then if there is this distance, you had to do it, you know? The it's Humboldt, not, there's the Humboldt no book you read, was that... Um, a yeah, it was like... Uh, was about, that the he write it? Or no, was it, it was a biography about him, actually. Oh, okay. Uh, he wrote like a cosmos or something like that. Mm -hmm. It was very... Uh, it was, it, it, you know, his journey was intriguing. He, he was such an explorer. He went down, he went to America, South America, and uh, he was... Uh, like, Jefferson was uh, fascinated by him. He was staying yeah. there for a while. And they, he and another friend, I can't remember who it was, and they were traveling together, and they were climbing these mountains, and they were, uh, they were really more South American explorers. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, the um, Machu Picchu and all that. I, I don't remember 
know if no. they went down there, but they, anyway, they captured so many fossils. All, the Andes, and, all those Andes. Right, yeah, all the Andes, yeah. right. And they went and, c- and captured animals and, uh, and, and yeah. they sent back like four ships worth of, mm-hmm. of things and two of them capsized or something like that. Mm. So a lot of the material was lost. Um, but I just loved reading about it, and it, it's like I hadn't heard about him. And I love it when you find somebody like that who you haven't heard about, and you in- introduce this whole new world, and it's just so cool. That's why what we talked about the other day about fiction and nonfiction, mm-hmm. it seems such a dead end to read fiction. Yeah, it's just not fun. I mean, the story, but then it's it. Although on the other hand, it's cool because so much of fiction is referenced uh, in you know when you read history or whatever. Oh, you and, mean the other way around? Right. Yeah. So then you want to be aware of what they're talking about yeah you know yeah although you know it's funny when you think of fiction I think of the uh, the my favorite you know 18th century works are uh, like Gulliver's Travels oh and, uh, Ooh, and Robinson, Crusoe. Robinson Crusoe that is one of my favorites the, I remember being so surprised when I first read that book that it was not a child's book yeah it was not a, a serious yeah. it's a psycho book psycho book yeah it's amazing how if people read those books they would probably find them quite good Mm -hmm. and much more complex that's yeah right especially gulliver's travels which is like a (laughs) bizarre did you read gulliver's travels no i no i actually never read the whole i read like when i was young you know a short version or something stupid you know (laughs) yeah but the real version of that book is quite insane yeah Uh, an adult right it's not like a child's oh it's not a child's book at all yeah not at all yeah no no, it's, a, it's quite a great Because that was the same story. with like Robinson Crusoe. I remember being so surprised when they were first talking about Robinson's father yeah. and what, uh, oh, his point of view of the world That's in the right. middle. Yeah, stay safe in the middle. Exactly. Don't venture out. Don't go on the edges. Stay yeah. in the middle and you'll be safe. Yeah, basically, his, I guess it, it, it's the concept to be middle income, middle education, right. middle Don't everything. rock the boat. Yeah, don't rock the boat. And he decided he wanted to do something more. Right. And I feel like it's so easy to identify with that, that you want something more for well, yourself in your, your life. And you can you see know? the way uh, in the book he talks about providence. And mm-hmm. talk constantly. Yeah, like, right. Like yeah, it's, a very, it's a recurring theme in that book. Like everything that happens to him is destiny. Yeah. And everything that, and usually bad. You know what's, what's even more crazy is that uh, when that book ends, when when his journey on the deserted island ends, mm-hmm. then he has that massive journey through Europe, mm-hmm. back to his wife. Yeah. And okay. I can't, you know, I'm confusing it. I remember the end of either that book or Gulliver's Travels. He basically, I think it was, I think it was Robinson Crusoe, and he basically says, you know, actually, I'm, I'm out of here, you're out of here, whatever. I, I don't remember the end of Robinson Crusoe. Either that, but he basically, I think he goes away from. Whatever history, I can't remember anymore. Yeah, I think we're mixing. You're mixing them I, up. Yeah, I think I am. I think it was yeah. probably Gulliver's Travels. He comes back. Yeah. And he basically, after he visits the Yahoos and everybody else, which they never put that part, the Yahoos especially, um, in in the abbreviated versions. Well, I'm not. I never read abbreviated uh-huh. version, but I remember they did some TV show movies or yeah. TV movies on this stuff, and it's it's a joke mm-hmm. compared to the real thing. Yeah. It's a very, very dark, sophisticated book. Yeah. It's a mental problems. All right. the, these books are all basically yeah. mental problems. And they're yeah, so it's, good. It's, it's kind of interesting when you under, when you realize that. That so many it's almost like when you're young and you hear about all these classic works and, and you are like, Okay, they would be they would be like reasonable to read. You know, they would be they good get, to read. They, but then you read them. They get mixed up with Treasure Island though. That's why. That book was written a hundred years later. Over over a hundred years later, and that book was kind of an adventure book. Yeah, and that's often mixed up with that. It's okay, the market. Okay, I mean, yeah, it's probably not true for all of them, but some of these books, which you you know, when you're young, you don't really understand why, but then you read them, and then you're like, you're blown away, because you think they're so awesome, and they yeah. get to you. Well, like you know, Dick and they too. somebody understands you in a sense, you know. Well, or yeah. you understand them. You feel like you're on the same level as them. Well, I, th- I, I guess it's, <laughs> it's, I guess it's good when you're reading these, and and you're like, well, I d- identify with this character, even uh-huh. though this character is, is. <laughs> in, how many years ago? <laughs> well, in the world that they're in, they're considered abnormal usually. Yeah. And they're not on the normal scale in their world. They wouldn't be on the normal scale in this world either. They're quite extreme. Yeah. 
they're dedicated well, or weird. That or... makes me think about The Stranger. Oh, yeah, Camus. Camus, yeah. And uh, that book takes place in... Al- Morocco. Al- Morocco. Yeah. And uh, it does such a wonderful job of describing the environment and the heat in his mind. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I remember he ate blood sausage in the book, which somehow stuck with me. Uh, and it had this kind of psycho, the, the ocean, the warmth. the But then it's about his, it's about a murder and it's about yeah. this trial and it's about his... He's kind of, kind of, he's very, he's confused, you know. Yeah. And it, it got to me so, so much. You yeah, know? there's so many things that I, I agree with you on some of those points, but then there's like so many things that you say I forget. Yeah, it's I it's amazing. I see it from a but some point people, of view. yeah, exactly. Look at things from two I different I think about it from the heat. I love the heat concept. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I love it. Reminds me of like being in Havana or something like that. Yeah. You know the the, the oppressive heat and yeah. the kind of the the conspiratorial situation. <laughs> And that's so, it's so intense. Yeah. Although I think Gulliver's Travels is far more psychologically weird Mm -hmm. than the Camus book. Is it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's weird. Hmm. I mean, in a good way. It's really, you know, somebody, we were, we were pointing out a book not too long ago to somebody, Dostoevsky's uh, Brothers Karamazov. Uh Uh-huh. And, you know... And they're 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 older than we are, <laughs> and you know they're like oh oh I know Dostoevsky <laughs> or something like that, and so you know we, we we said oh this is a good book it's uh-huh. a it's a it's interesting it's very long, um you know you might like it you know and they they read I don't know like a, maybe a, a fifty a, pages out of it no I think yeah something like that maybe yeah. a little bit more, and it it's it's such a weird book yeah it is. It's one of those books that I remember when I read it, it, it took like all summer because I, I wasn't devoting a whole lot of time to it. Mm-hmm. And it was kind of a relaxing book to read at night when you were going to sleep. Because mm-hmm. you would only get a couple pages read before you fall asleep. Although then never, nothing sticks with you, at least for me anyway. If I read something when I'm about oh, to go to sleep, no, I, I, I forget think, about it all. <laughs> no, I think it, I think it's a good time for me. I think it's a, really? Before you go to sleep, I think it's a good time. Yeah. I think generally people uh, say that, that if, if you uh-huh. learn or read something at night, uh, it does stick with you. If you, you know, if you allow it. <laughs> Depends on how sleepy you are when you start, and then you fade down, and then you don't remember any well, of it. Well, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's not a book that it's a page. Did you read the Paris Cousin? No, mm-hmm. I, I was just thinking about that. I never read that one. I read, read Crime and Punishment. punishment. Right. I loved that one. Yeah. Yeah, I always wanted to read the Brother, Brother Karamazov, but it always felt like such a, a mountain to climb. You it know? is. It's like, a big book. It was like, is when <laughs> is it worth it? And do I have like? It's like I want to like be prepared to read it. <laughs> So I, I suppose even though we are, you know, bad-mouthing fiction sometimes, mm. these are all fictional books we're talking about. Yeah. But they're really quite intense. Yeah. And that book is intense in a whole different way than uh, uh, Gulliver's Travels or Robinson Crusoe. Yeah. Because it's not one person. Oh, okay. Those mm-hmm. books are like one person psycho journeys. Yeah, right. The Brothers Karamazov is this, this three brothers. Yeah. And, you know, the, the weird situations they deal with basically right but there's so many things that you don't realize i don't know as time moves on the book gets stranger and stranger to normal you know normal like you mm-hmm. know earthlings now <laughs> and so as time goes on i can imagine as people read that book in the future they're going to think this book is really yeah it's increasingly it weird. becomes yeah I, I yeah i see what you're saying that uh it, the, the writing style, the, the psychology, the behavior. It's, yeah, it's, it's all about It's like psychology. further and further away from your life. Exactly. Yeah, uh, the darkness that is that is Dostoevsky yeah. in all of his writing yeah, is dark. so dark. It's so it's so depressing. Yeah. It's, you know, what you, it's, you, it's what you'd expect. But then the behavior of the characters is what you wouldn't expect because they don't act like you do. Uh-huh. They don't think like you do. Yeah. They think like someone in you know mid nineteenth century Russia, Russia. <laughs> which is uh, you know they have uh, what was that uh, I can't remember who said it now, but uh, it's a negative word. It's a negative concept about Russians that if you uh, if you scratch a Russian you get a peasant. It's like in other words, if you look underneath the surface of any uh, given Russian, you have a peasant. Okay, and I can't remember who like said that. It's like an underlying yes, it's a, it's yeah because the serfdom lasted so yeah. long there right. and all that. I can't remember who said it. I don't think it was Dostoevsky, but I can't remember. Hmm. Uh, could have been Tolstoy, hmm. whatever. But that concept is is at the heart of those books. Yeah. 
that everybody is kind of sees themselves in this lower class or lower uh, dirt way. You know, the whole, the whole idea about like class structure, that is one thing that um, it's very integrated in Swedish culture, uh, class structure, even though people try to get away from it. and uh, But it really is very inherent in many people's behavior and, and beliefs and I, don't you think it's everywhere about the united states i mean in many ways? maybe that's i mean that's just what i'm familiar with yeah. so that's what i go back to but yeah that might be true but i'm just saying that's why uh, th there are many things about the u.s which is not ideal uh but now, there, uh, now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh fundamentally i love that about you know, america that the, the idea of class structure doesn't exist in the same way there's no yeah. history of it where people feel defined by it so it's like people are are freer in that sense and it's it's such a pride concept of of the culture you know yeah i think that it, that that's like one of the best parts i don't of know this country yeah it, it yeah I, I mean it depends who you are and where you yeah. are and, and all that Right, but it's almost like people are not even aware of it here because it's not a big deal. Yeah. Whereas in Europe, it's, it's, it's penetrating all aspects of life and like where they're going, where they're from. Even the modern Sweden. <laughs> even the progressive Pro modern progressive, Sweden, yeah, although exactly. they probably wouldn't admit it. But yeah. I remember that. I can't remember the uh, Christmas show. The Swedish oh, Christmas uh, show. Oh, Carl Bertil Jonsson's Julafton. You'll the have to go slower and repeat that. Okay, the Christmas of Carl Bertil Jonsson. Car Carl Bertil Jonsson. <laughs> <laughs> Carl Bertil Jonsson? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a Christmas story of this uh, that was made in, I guess, the 50s, maybe? I think look, so. That's what the drawings look like. We've looked like, at it online. Yeah, and it's about this this poor, oh, no, he's not so poor, his father is a uh, post manager post office manager or something like that and he uh, he's touched this young boy not a young boy but he's like a teenager he's touched yeah. by the poverty around him and there's yeah. a lot of poverty and he takes it upon himself he's he's doing some ex, you know uh, extra work around christmas at the post office the post he basically door. takes all the presents that all the uh, the, the rich the, kids you know get. the aunts and uh, you know oh, people yeah. who send who, that are not really nobody really wants these presents oh, you know oh, when your right. grandmother send you porcelain from you know this weird country to you for Christmas or you know weird presents which aren't real nobody really wants and he basically reallocates them to the poor yeah and it's, uh, it's basically pushing communists or really it really is and I remember it was such a p big part uh, of my childhood growing up and around Christmas <laughs> it was like it was just something we watched every year and it was Along always I always liked exactly Donald Duck which is everybody in Sweden watched Donald Duck at three o'clock on Christmas Eve you got to figure that most people who hear this are going to be American or uh, yeah something in that they don't understand what you mean it's true every Christmas Eve uh, in Sweden like 90% of the Swedish population sit down and watch a uh, compilation. Call it, compilation of uh, Disney cartoons. <laughs> <laughs> Since the 1950s, right? Yes. And it's uh, it's some classics. We have, you know, Donald Duck. We have like Mowgli, Mickey, Mickey Mouse. Pluto. Yes. There are a couple of classics that are there every year. And then they have uh, like one or two new editions. And what do you call Donald Duck in up. Swedish? Kalianka. Kalianka. Uh -huh. So weird. <laughs> yeah. I was there one year. Uh huh. And I remember at three o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah. On the dot. Yeah. Everybody is watching Kalanka. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, this is just this is Disney cartoon. Yeah. And the whole country is watching this. Yep. It's weird. It is. And there's always like a, when you ask what other pe families do on Christmas, it's like, well, do you eat Christmas dinner before or after Donald Duck? <laughs> 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 and, uh, you open the presents before that, right? Or after? We afterwards. Afterwards. You can't. It was okay. barbaric to open them before. <laughs> but, uh, you know, maybe one for breakfast. But, um, I don't even know where we were going with all this. Yeah, I don't know. The it, class it structure in Sweden. The class structure in Sweden. Oh, Carl Bertil Jonsson. Yeah. Um, but it was such a, uh, like the, I didn't realize growing up that it ha does certainly have certain communist tendencies. Yeah. Um, but well, when I saw it, that's what I thought. Yeah, that's what you thought. And I just thought that he was giving, uh, you know, he's kind and he was thinking he was of the poor. Jerk. And he was a jerk. Well, I don't know about a jerk. He, he, he was, a, uh, yeah, he does have certain, this is a particular way about him. I think, that way. <laughs> where, what does all this have to do with Darwin Orber and woodworking? 
What do you think? Oh, God. That is kind of a stretch, doesn't it? I think it all goes back to... Um, it's. It, it, I think it all goes back to when someone's driving in their car, they, they'll listen to anything. <laughs> <laughs> or they probably, if they, if they have stick around for that long, yeah. Stuck around. Yeah. Stuck around. Yeah. What did I say? Stick around. If they're stick around, stuck around. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I guess, I mean, fundamentally, I think it all goes back to, like, doing something with your life. Being bold and, and want to do things and want to be creative and want to create things. And that's, that's what I. Yeah. That's what I think it goes back to. That's you know with the woodworking, with the making is for and, me. And the Robinson Crusoe. And Robinson Crusoe. <laughs> he was definitely someone who did not want to have a boring normal no, life. No, he wanted to take risks and be adventurous and and go for it. Yeah, he yeah. did. And he got punished for it, sort of, right? Yeah, he he definitely did. Over he did not again. have an easy life. Yeah. Yeah. But it was interesting. But life. it was epic. Yeah. You know? And as long as someone like, recorded it. Where? Yeah, that's true. <laughs> well, but he recorded where it. It does that, like, when is it worth it, you know? If you have a terrible kind of existence, striving for that one kind of epic moment. Well, then that's worth it. I would say it yeah. is worth it. Yeah. I guess it depends on It's what, not a very practical point of view, life, though, though. You know? It's an artistic point of view. It's not like a, I have a family and a job and a life and I live every day kind of, you know, in a practical sense. It's a I want to be great point of view. That's a, that's, I don't, I don't really see that too much. Oh, I agree with you. That's, Where is it? I, I want to see, see it more. I want to see the passion in people. I think because there's, there's, I don't know, it's like there's a lot of people mm -hmm. and uh, more and more people are educated and mm -hmm. they're aware and they're aware of all the problems in the world. Right. And they're aware of all the inequalities in the world. Yeah. And it just seems very selfish to go kind of be what you're saying, Robinson Crusoe. You're leaving everybody. Yeah. You're, you're leaving your one responsibilities. Could, one could put it that way. But on the other hand, isn't, isn't it selfish for the world to not let him go? Well, that's, yeah. Okay. I mean, for his family. I don't mean the world is in the world. I mean, people in his surrounding who, which are grieving his absence. Isn't it selfish for them? No, yeah, I, I think we're in a different point of view. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about that the, the pressures are different. What do you mean? There's, like I said, the people today, they are in a very different situation than someone in the early 18th century. Yeah. They're, they're not... They're not really on their own in the same way. They're living at home very long. Oh. They're getting, you know, they, they can't really afford to go to school on their own. They, so you... You don't get a chance in this. Unless you're very wealthy, yeah. you don't get a chance to be on your own in that same way. Like, you That's don't just true. get on a merchant ship and go no. across the world. No, you don't. You know, especially now with the cell phones and it's it's a whole different... Yeah. You can't it's really be like, yourself. Hey, that's what I was going to get to. Nobody is ever really alone these yeah. days. Everybody are all constantly connected in some way yeah. to their old life. There's no breaking away. There's no starting fresh. I, I agree. And it's and it's difficult to do when people are tracking your cell phone. Like right. Your, and your when family or somebody something. can check your Facebook profile and, and oh, yeah, there's too. like yeah. no... There's yeah. no escape from it. So all those classic literature characters... Especially are, if you were online when you were younger and you were, like, doing, you know, stupid things. Oh. And, and there's pictures and stuff. And, yeah. and there's, like, no way for you to, like, get rid of that, you know? It's like the web is a curse in that sense. No, I agree. Yeah, as, as, as many good things have happened with better technology... It does reduce the individual. Yeah, it really does. It, from them achieving. Yeah. But it makes everybody else more equal. Yeah. It gives everybody else it more opportunity. It has really its ups and downs. Yeah. Yeah. I think th you would basically could see across the board that the individual has been reduced. Mm -hmm. You don't really have those, you know, the single characters or the single strong personalities. Yeah. They're not really out there in the same way. No. Nobody's encouraging that in people either, because they don't see that. And then we go back to the, uh, the 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 idea that everybody grows up pretty much in the same situation, and nobody is really uh, growing up in a really weird way, yeah. which also makes everybody more. Well, the I guess same. no matter what country you're in, too, you're all using Facebook. You're all using Instagram. Yeah. So it doesn't matter where in the world you really are anymore. Right. So that makes everybody just more the same, more a little more boring, and it really puts a you know a damper on the individual <laughs> and then but the funny thing is 
then something may change in a moment and we didn't even see it coming and that point of view is no longer you don't look at it the same way well, like I, this I, subtle change and we wouldn't even be aware of it well I agree you mean as people as people who think like this uh -huh. they go away yeah they well exactly they don't even realize it anymore it's That's like all that the has focus to shifts I've never I don't hear people talking about this yeah. they don't care yeah they're more concerned with social justice and getting yeah. equality and getting everybody jobs and education yeah. they're not really caring about the pursuit of the individual for greatness that's not <laughs> it the seems concept like when you say that it sounds kind of psycho well that's because, because everybody I, I love it's that psycho now. I love that concept but it is kind of psycho at the same time well it's, it's anti-community it, it is a bit anti-community yeah. I guess it's all about what what's the point of it all well that's why it's fun to read history and read yeah. these these books yep and you realize how different things are now mm -hmm. and they, they do change pretty rapidly mm -hmm. <laughs> although it seems like it always seems like the last few years are changed more rapidly than things before but because yeah. that's what you remember right but and it's, I guess it's always been changing rapidly yeah and yeah for, it's almost like every at every time you there's always one somebody saying oh this is the greatest time ever because there's so many things that are changing right now oh, and yeah. there's so much progress and so much innovation going on well yeah, I guess it always depends on your, your point of view yeah. if you're saying this is the best time ever and in many ways it is it is very free yeah but uh, it also is very restrictive yeah with being easy tracked it's like the best and, and the worst time at the same time uh, but now you can get money easier things are relatively cheaper yeah there's more personal freedom there's more access to things in general. Yeah, certainly information. Yeah. You can learn more cheaper than ever. I don't think yeah. it's ever not an interesting time. Yeah. Those those dead years during the Middle Ages, maybe when no one did Ooh. anything, everybody. Like the Dutch paintings at the Louvre. No, those are that's the Flemish period. Oh well, that's they're very the, dark. Uh, no. Yeah, that no, that's not the Middle Ages though. No, <laughs> <laughs> no, I just but that's what it made me think about because this was so dark. I remember when we went to see that at the Louvre. I, mm -hmm. the, the, I hate those paintings. Mm -hmm. But I love them because they have this kind of intensity about them, but they are depressing. They're all death. Yeah. Yeah, very it's depressing. all weird. Let's leave everybody with a little bit of woodworking. Why don't we uh, say something interesting about woodworking? Okay. What's your favorite finish? Oh, well, I, you know, I don't, pff, my favorite finish, <laughs> well, I, I mean, I love this simple wax and oil finish in general on wood, if it's a nice wood, because I think you can't beat it. But on the other hand, I love to start out with something, uh, maybe like a, sh like a shellac or uh, even a polyurethane and then finish it off with a wax finish. Because then you kind of get the best of both worlds, you get the protection. And because wax does wear off, you know. Unless you're talking about paint, of course. <laughs> because I love paint. And then you can also finish it with wax, which I think is nice. We should really get this uh, podcast sponsored sooner or later by <laughs> somebody <laughs> who has a woodworking product. Would we have to talk about woodworking more? Would we? If we had a sponsor? Probably. That was a woodworking They probably kind of would thing? want that. Maybe like at least fifty percent would have to be woodworking related or baker related. I don't think we should let a sponsor dictate the content. No, that would be terrible. No. You know, the thing is, we talked about history, but we didn't talk about the history of in any way woodworking. Mm, you know, that could be another interesting topic. That's a whole other podcast. Yeah. Yeah. This is more history of the world, the <laughs> literature. We didn't talk about the Greeks at all, though. <laughs> the Greeks were left out. <laughs> The Romans were left out. Well, we'll get back to them sooner or later. Yeah. We have a lot to say about that stuff. Historical fiction. Robert Graves is awesome. <laughs> that was so much fun to read. We'll leave that for next time. Leave that for next time. Thanks for listening. Okay. Um, we'll see you next time. Okay. Bye-bye.